Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom to everybody online. My name is Paul Henry, and Pastor Mike has asked me to serve as one of the apostolic elders here, and I agreed to do that, and so it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to see all of you and to be able to fellowship with like-minded people and talk to people and them not look back at me like a deer staring at the headlights. <laughs> do y'all know what that feels like? <laughs> so there's a little bit uh, today of me feeling like I'm almost preaching to the choir, but uh, the topic that Pastor Mike asked me to speak on, uh, the spirit of the law, is really a, a big passion of mine. Um, and you'll have to excuse my voice. I'm going to have surgery on Tuesday on my voice and my vocal cords. Um, and Mike, Pastor Mike asked me, uh, I don't know, a little while, a couple weeks, week or so ago, he said, you think your voice would be okay? You want to get somebody else? And I didn't even have to pray about it. I just instantly replied, but no, no, uh, no, please no. And he knew we would be here today. He knew I would be here today. He knew what I would be going through. He, would, he knew what you would be going through. And he knew what we would be talking about. Uh, so we're going to talk about the spirit of the law today. And uh, it is, quite honestly, a very big topic. Um, but contrary, I believe, to a lot of people's beliefs, it is also, I believe, a simple topic. If we will simply look at what the scriptures say. And you're going to hear me harp on that today. It is huge. And I want to forewarn you. You need to pay special attention. I'm going to encourage you to take some notes. I'm going to give you a few rules today when we get there. And I really believe that these rules will help you stay in your lane, not get in a wreck, spiritually speaking, theologically speaking, and arrive on the other side safely. Uh, and quite honestly, our physical um, safety in the near future could be at risk. So it's critical that you pay attention to what we're going to be talking about because we need to be in the Word of God, correct? Amen. At the same time, we need to understand what we're reading. And I'm sorry, but being spoon-fed is over. You're going to have to engage your brain. You're going to have to slow down. And you're going to have to actually read what it says. You're not going to be able to look at the pictures and figure out how to put the cabinet together. This isn't Ikea. This is the Word of God and eternity. And there's a physical reality coming that I'll guarantee you 90% of us are not ready for it. Because when Yeshua comes back, it's not going to be what most of us in this room even think. He's coming back as king, and he's going to clean house. But guess where he says he starts? He starts in our house, his house. He's going to clean house. And so it's critically important that we understand what he said and what he's saying, and watch this, that we get our lives right in spite of what we think and in spite of what we feel. You're going to have to let all that stuff aside. Go with what the Word of God says. You better get right with your king because he's coming back. And he ain't playing games. He ain't playing no games. He's king. And he will be honored. He will be glorified. And his name will not be profaned any longer. That's why it says every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he and he alone is God. And when this happens, there will be no doubt. There will be no debate. There'll be no opinion. It will be fact. Indisputed fact. So what we're going to talk about is the spirit of the law. Sorry, none of that's in my notes, so y'all just get prepared. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that was, yeah, that just rolled out. So, um, listen, before we do any of that, uh, we need to pray, okay? Let's just, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do love you very much. Sweet, holy Jesus, speak to our hearts. Draw us into your presence. Lord, strip away everything in our lives that's hindering us from following you. God, help us to be right and tight with you. 
God, help us to be pure in heart, humble before you, our King. God, cause your word today to spring forth life within us, to convict us and change us, Lord, from the inside out. Give us a desire, Lord, to love you that we cannot stir up on our own. Plant that within us and give us a longing, a yearning for you and for your word. Please, God, hear our prayers. And we pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to start with uh, a few examples, okay? So in Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. So I'm just going to throw out a few things here because we're going to need to engage our brains and think. Y'all okay with that? You had enough coffee? You need some more? Because we're going to engage a few things, all right? So right here, this is Yeshua talking. Let me, let me preface this in, in case I don't do it later, but I probably will. Is Yeshua the Son of God? Has He always existed with the Father? Okay, you online, y'all can reply too. Uh, would he ever lie to us? No. Would he ever lead us astray? No. Could he be possibly wrong? No. Maybe he's confused. No. So he's right. Yes. We should listen to what he says. You sure? Yes. Okay, I'm just asking, just asking a question. Keep that as your foundation. He's not going to lie to you. He can't be wrong if he's God in the flesh. Amen. He's always existed. He's not going to lead us astray. He's not going to lie to us. So we need to pay attention to what he said. As a matter of fact, his father said, I'm going to send him. You better listen to him. And if you don't, I'm going to hold you accountable. That's pretty strong. So here's what he said. What he said was, for the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father. This is in Matthew 16, starting with verse 27. With his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Amen? I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I think, I might be confused, but I think the people that were listening to him died. But right here he says they're not going to taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. There are people out there that are going to throw this at you and say, you see, Yeshua is not the Messiah, He's a false prophet. He said that they would not taste death, and they did. Hold on. Does that upset anybody? Good. It shouldn't. If your foundation is that Yeshua is king and He's not wrong, then... If we read this and think, okay, there's a problem, I'll give you a little hint. The problem is with your understanding, is not with him. So let's go on. He says it again in another place in Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Yeshua was telling them, amen, I tell you, there are some standing here who will never taste death until they see the kingdom of God coming with power. Oops, some of them died, right? I mean, it's been 2,000 years. I don't know anybody that's beat it yet, except, you know... Uh, maybe Elijah, you know, Enoch, you know. But then we do have two witnesses coming in the near future. Just a guess, but it could be them. Um, anyhow, uh, he said that uh, they wouldn't taste death, but they did. Let's look at this again, because he says something else that's maybe even a little bit more startling, if you will. It's in John chapter 8, verses 51 and 52. He says, Amen, Amen, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Anybody know any believers that have died before you? I got friends and family that did. My cousin, God bless him. For 20 years off and on, probably 20, I think was coaxing me about Torah and me being a pastor and I couldn't do it. And we were finally meeting again and again and again. He's with the Lord now. We were sitting at Starbucks talking about it again. And he said, Paul, get out your Bible and read Deuteronomy 13. I read it. 
first five or six verses, I looked up at him and I said, I have a problem, don't I? He said, yes, you do. And that verse opened the floodgates for me to come into understanding that Torah does apply. Um, Yeshua didn't change the Torah. He shed the proper light on it. Amen. So, if you keep reading, in here it says these religious leaders, these Judean leaders, it says, Now we know that you have a demon. The Judean leaders said to him, Abraham and the prophets died, yet you said, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death. So the Judean leaders at that time said, well, now we know you're, you're a false prophet. You've got a demon. You're saying people won't taste death if they keep your word. Which I find kind of fascinating, right? Because it's almost like right here they're admitting that his word is the word of God. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like they're hanging themselves in the whole process. But leave that aside because that will open up another sermon. But it's interesting that they said that right here. Now, so was Jesus wrong or is it? Maybe that we don't fully understand what he's talking about. Because these verses seem to have a contradiction. I'm going to give you a little clue. Your Bible doesn't have contradictions. They're not there. Uh, we just need to dig. Amen? So what are they, what's he really talking about? When he says they'll not taste death, this is a clue. We're going to get into these rules here in just a second. You have to pay attention to the details. Okay? And you're going to have to think. So first of all, Jesus doesn't lie and he doesn't lead us astray, right? And he said they're not going to taste death. But you have to pay attention to who he's talking to and what he's talking about. Okay? When you get into Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. Revelation chapter 2 verse 11 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach, or what the Spirit is saying to the Messiah's communities, to the churches. The one who overcomes shall never be harmed by the second death. Yeah. Folks, right here he wasn't talking about physical death. He's talking about eternal death. That's why he said some here, some. Some standing here, Meaning, they will be at judgment. And when that time happens, and the Son of Man is coming in His kingdom in power, which happens when? At the end of time, right? So when all that happens, and they're awakened unto judgment. And they're going to taste the second death. Those that are there that are keeping His words will never be harmed by the second death. They will never see death. Does that make sense now? It's not a contradiction. It's just pay attention to the details. The people that will argue with you and throw this stuff at you are going to look at the Bible using what some will call a hyper-literalism and very shallow. And they will use doctrine as their filter to tell them what they think the words are actually saying. You know what you need to do? You need to get rid of your doctrine. You need to get back into your Bible. You need to just read your Bible. I've said this for years and years and years. Those of you that have been here, there's a few. You know what I'm about to say. There's three things that are going to help you be successful in your life. Only three. You can, you can write this down. You can do this for the rest of your life. There's three things you need to do. It's simple. The first one is pray. The second one is Read your Bible. And the third one, repeat. <laughs> just that simple. Pray, read, repeat. Pray, read, repeat. If you'll just do that, if you'll just read your Bible, it'll change your life. Jesus said you'll know the truth and it will what? It'll set you free. A lie will never do that. But the truth and the truth of the Word of God, no matter what is going on in your life, will set you free. The devil can only make you think you're in jail. He can even put your body in jail, but you're not in jail. If you're in the kingdom of God, you're a powerful and dangerous person. Not to other people, but to the devil himself. So the answer here is that it's a spiritual and eternal death. Now, 
The Bible is filled with what seem to be hard to understand and sometimes seem to look like contradictory statements when in fact they're not. Now folks, this is the very reason why Pastor Mike is taking us and taking you through the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians has to be one of the most misunderstood books in your Bible. Um, And I know some of you are asking, so when are we going to get to Galatians? (laughs) When are we going to get back to Galatians? Well, the issue is, there's fundamental facts that we need to understand as you're reading the book of Galatians so that you can stay on track and stay within your lane and not end up in the ditch. If you don't know who's talking and who they're talking to and what they're talking about, then you can come up with all kinds of stuff, right? But you have to understand the background information. And this is part of it. Now, Peter warned us. I don't know if you know that this is in your Bible. But Paul wrote the book, the letter to the Galatians, right? And Peter warned us. He said, you know, Paul, I don't know if he's talking about me. I probably wouldn't, but he's like, this Paul dude, I mean, he talks about this stuff. Can we read the passage together? Because it's in your Bible if you haven't read it before. It's 2 Peter chapter 3, it's verse 15 and 16. Now, pay attention to what he says. This is critically important. This might even just start to set you free, I don't know. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 says, Bear in mind that the patience of our Lord means salvation. In other words, he's waiting until he comes back because not everybody's born and not everybody's in the kingdom yet. You need to understand something. God's accounting is perfect. He's not going to lose one soul that he's waiting on. Not one. That's why at Mount Sinai, 3,000 died. You remember that story? Well, guess what happened at Pentecost? 3,000 came in. He's not going to lose one. He's going to have all the sheep he's supposed to have in his field. And the devil's not going to get one that he's not supposed to have. So he's patient, meaning salvation. He's waiting. So if you're ready to go home and you're not going home yet, that's because God's still bringing people into his kingdom. He's not ready yet, but I believe it's close. Bear in mind that the patience of our Lord means salvation. Just as our dearly loved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom given to him, he speaks about these matters in all of his letters. Some things in them are hard to understand. Duh. Right? He said, Peter says some of the things that Paul says and he's writing down, they're hard to understand. Don't stop reading. Which the ignorant and unstable twist. They're twisting what Paul says. As they do the rest of the scriptures, I find that interesting. Because Peter right here is acknowledging that the Apostle Paul was writing as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He compares Paul's writings with the rest of scriptures. He says, they, the ignorant and unstable twist as they do the rest of the scriptures, watch this, to their own destruction. Anybody ever feel like that's right where you were before you came to understand these truths? Oh my goodness, heading straight for destruction. Doesn't necessarily mean eternal damnation, but just destroying your life. Does that make sense? So right here, Peter is warning his readers that the things of Paul are hard to understand. And it's the ignorant and unstable that are twisting it. He's calling these people ignorant. Well, that's not politically correct nowadays. What are they ignorant of and unstable about? They're ignorant in their understanding of the Torah. That's what he's saying. And they're unstable, meaning they're teetering, they're about to fall. And on top of that, untrained. Paul was a master in the Torah. When he met Yeshua on the road and he gets his eyes cleared up, guess where he went? He went into the wilderness 
I believe, back to the original Mount Sinai, met with God and was taught by God, by Yeshua Himself, for a long time to reveal to Paul the spirit of the Torah. In other words, what is it all about? What's he really saying? What's the meaning behind all this? When we say the spirit of the law, the spirit of the... That's what we're talking about. What's it really saying? What's the purpose? What's the meaning behind all this? Instead of just all the, the details. Do you get caught up in the details? We get caught up in details. Even those of us that are following the Torah, we get caught up in details. I wear a seat, but mine's way back here for a lot of reasons. Where did it go? There it is. There it is. And I, I do that, and I wear this one basically because of my cousin, Kurt, that brought me into Torah. I was wearing all my seat seats, and he said, you know, everybody, they worry about wearing four of them. I said, yeah, I know. He said, because God said, put it on the four, your four-cornered garment. I said, yeah, but we don't have a four-cornered garment. I'm like, Yeah. And he said, nowhere did God say it has to be white and blue. He just says, wear tassels. And he says, you know what the main thing is? He says, you wear them so that you remember to do what I told you to do. So guess what? Which I know it's offensive to some people. I've got them on a messenger bag that I carry some of my stuff in. I've got one hanging on the gear shift in my truck. I've got them scattered around so that I'll try to remember to do what God said because after all, I am an idiot. I know none of you are, but I'm an absolute idiot. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, and I'm not the sharpest knife in the box. And I just, I have to put stuff around me to go, Paul, shut your mouth. Just do what you're supposed to do. I have to put that stuff around me because I know, man, I've, anybody here other than me make at least one mistake? Some of y'all making one right now. Okay, so... I have to put stuff around me to make sure that I don't mess up again, okay? This is one of them. And so mine is black and blue and stuff, and it's it's there for me. Sometimes I think it's black and blue because I've been black and blue a lot because I just get a whooping every time I turn around going, and God's going, why'd you do that? And I go, I'm an idiot. Please forgive me. I really think my angel's pretty tired. He's like, God, he's at it again, you know. Anyways, so they're untrained and unstable, and they're twisting the words of Paul to their own destruction. Well, we want to keep from doing that, amen? And to be able to do that, we've got to understand what he's talking about and what the spirit of the Torah is all about. Um. Let me give you another example of how people distort the Word of God every day uh, and how they twist things. Yeshua said if we love Him, we would keep His commandments. And when you quote this to people, when you tell people this, like I told this to our church, I said, Yeshua said if you love Him, you keep His commandments. And I just asked a simple question. I didn't know asking a question was going to get me in that much trouble. But I asked a question. I said, which ones? And man, did the exodus start. I said, the ones when he was wearing skin, when he became flesh, or the ones before he was wearing skin, or just those, or all of them. So Jesus said, Yeshua said, if we loved him, we'd keep his commandments. And here's what will happen. You quote any of these kinds of things to people, and here's what they're going to say. Yeah, but Paul said. Yeah, but James said in Acts 15. Yeah, but uh, Luke said uh, that Jesus declared all foods clean. And they'll go on, they'll go, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And I go, there is no yeah, buts. Go back. If Yeshua is God and King and He doesn't lie, there is no yeah, but. If He said it, that's it. And it doesn't even matter if you believe it or not. He said it, that's it. Right? So when Yeshua says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's pretty much it. There is no yeah, but. 
If there's a yeah, but, then that's what, then what you're telling me is you want Yeshua as your Savior, but you want all these other understandings in your Bible as your religion. I told that to the director of our Baptist convention. Ooh, the hair stood straight up and he said, that is not what I'm saying. I said, well, but that's what we're living and that's what you're basically telling everybody to do. That is not. And I said, well, you just said, yeah, but. If Jesus is God, then he's God. That settles it. If we misunderstand something else, and if there's anything, I'm going to go and tell you this. If you find something in your Bible that's contrary to what Jesus is saying, and that's really in your Bible, you should tear it out. It's not in there. It's your understanding of it, or it's a problem with the translation. There is no yeah, but. That's it. And they do that all the time. Why? Because they're looking at their Bible through a theological lens. And then they will take the words that they're reading superficially, and they'll make it sound like it fits their theology. Anybody here ever run into that? Any of us knuckleheads ever say it? Preached it. I'm preaching to the choir. I'm a pastor. I preach this stuff. We're so dumb, we can't, get, we can't count to three. That's a fact. Jesus said, I'm only going to give this wicked and adulterous generation one sign. I'm going to be in the ground three days and three nights. We tell everybody, died on Friday, rose on Sunday. That's three days and three nights. And we do it with a dumb grin on our face. Died on Friday, rose on Sunday. That's three days, three nights. I can't count <laughs> at all. Ain't that great? What's for lunch? Every day. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So here's the deal. I want, we could talk about all those verses and stuff, and all that's fine. I would rather give you some tools so you can do the digging yourself. How about that? These are some tools that will keep you on track so that you don't get in a wreck. I mean, if you drive down the highway, aren't you glad if you're on 635 and that diesel rig, don't you glad he's staying in his lane? And you'd better pay attention to your lane instead of his lane, right? The scripture's the same way. You need to pay attention and everybody stay in their lane so we don't get in a wreck. So what I want to do is I want to give you some of these tools that will help you stay on track. And what it's called, it's a big word, whatever. It's called hermeneutics. Anybody ever hear that? Hermeneutics. See, I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all are smart people. You are. You're through being told stuff and just accepting it at face value, aren't you? That's great. It's also dangerous. If you don't have the right tools, you can find yourself in the ditch. You can find yourself turning into what they call a Torah terrorist. A legalist. Uh, you're not doing it right, this, all that. I'm telling you, God wants your heart more than he wants your actions. Once he has your heart, the actions will line up. They'll just fall into place once he has the heart. And that's what he's after. But here's the trick. It's tied to our actions. <laughs> if we don't understand why we're doing the actions then that's when we get tripped up again. And that's what I hope we'll find out today. So this means you're going to have to engage your mind and you're going to have to think. And you're going to have to slow down. I know it's a fast-paced world. For crying out loud, Siri won't stop listening to me. <laughs> I have an Apple Watch and it's, it's anyways... And I'll be doing something. Oh, this is what I found on the web. And I'm going, I'm not talking to you, Siri. And I'm like, Siri, you know you're an idiot. And then she'll go, well, that's not nice. <laughs> I've actually had her say that to me. Because I did call her an idiot. And she said, that's not nice. And I was like, well, it's because you are. Stop listening to me. I know we're in a fast-paced world. But when it comes to reading your Bible, you're going to have to slow down. You're going to have to slow down and read it and pay attention to the details. So I've got three rules for you 
that you need to jot these down. It's not the pray, read your Bible, and repeat, but don't forget that one. There are three rules to help you stay on track with reading your Bible. These are only three. There are many, but these are the top three. Okay? Critically important. Number one, your first understanding of any passage you read needs to be the simple surface meaning of the words. And you might go, well, duh. Will you be surprised how many people don't do that, including pastors and theologians? You read something, the next thing you know, you're running down some rabbit hole going, well, how in the world did I get here? And I don't want to chase that one because that one makes me nuts. I have a very high regard for the Word of God. I actually believe this. I actually believe there's a God. I actually believe He created everything. I think the God that created everything just might be smart enough to write a book. Maybe. I actually believe the book you've got in your lap is probably the very book of life. And that your name is in it. And that your God is that big to do that. You're holding it, looking at it. My gosh. That's why it talks about in the book of James that when you're looking into the Word, it's like looking into a mirror. You're seeing yourself. Oh my goodness. Now then, your first understanding of any passage needs to be the simple surface meaning of the words, which is, what does it say? Just what does it say? But here's what you need to remember. That's your first step. Because if you stay there and only do that one, you'll turn into a hyper-literalist, legalistic Torah terrorist. That's where you start, meaning, what does it say? What, just, just simply, what does it say? It's amazing how people just won't read what it says. I loved it last week, man. You, brother, you did an awesome job, man. You really did. If y'all missed that, y'all need to go back and listen to that and read that and, and, to pay it and listen to that and watch that. Absolutely amazing. And, you know, in Matthew 5, you know, 17 and following, and I just go, well, what does he say? We could just stop there and just end the debate and go home. We really could. He said he didn't come to destroy it. He didn't come to do away with it. And then he keeps talking. And I tell people, did you keep reading? You know? And one of the things I like to tell people is say, well, you know, Jesus fulfilled the law, therefore I don't have to. And I go, well, that's interesting. Sorry, if that's the case, all you women, y'all are in deep trouble. Did you know that? Because he didn't do one law pertaining to women. So if he did them so that you don't have to, sorry, ladies, you're out of luck. You see, that logic just doesn't work. Just what does he say? What, what does the passage say? Now, here's what I need to tell you. When you're dealing with this, you need to think of yourself kind of like a Sherlock Holmes character. And I'm serious. You're going to need to start looking for details that other people just simply refuse to look at. You're going to need to see the little things that they're just, they're passing over because he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. Therefore, I don't have to do it. You have to read anymore? No, I'm not reading anymore. I'm done. How, theologians do it all the time. I can't even tell you how many times I've been studying for a sermon. I know Pastor Mike's right. And you run across something that's kind of confusing. So you dig out every single commentary you've got and not one single person has enough guts to deal with it. Isn't that right? They just pass right over it like it's not even there. I'm like, are you kidding me? People do this all the time. And so you need to understand, what does the text simply say? But that is your starting point. That's your starting point. You have to go to the next one, which is king. This next rule I'm going to give you is king. It's kind of like location, location, location. You know, this one is called context. Rule number two is context. Context, context, context. Folks, this is critically important. And you would be shocked to find out how many pastors, teachers, theologians, 
refuse to follow this rule that they teach. Context, meaning, who's talking? Who are they talking to? What are they talking about? Right? In other words, just pay attention to who's talking and who they're talking to and what are they talking about. What, here's something else as far as context. What are you reading? Did you know there's different kinds of literature in your Bible? There's historical literature. There's doctrinal liter literature. There's poetic stuff in there. There's prophetic literature in there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are and Acts. That's historical documents. It has lies and deceit and all kinds of stuff in there because it's an accurate recording of historical things. Right? Some things are poetic in nature. You need to pay attention to what you're reading and who they're talking to. This is why Galatians can be very confusing. This is why you'll read things and go, okay, well, that's kind of odd. For instance, and sorry, but I've got a lot of stuff flying through my head. Um, you know, well, they're having the Jerusalem Council in Acts, and they ask Peter, and Peter goes, well, you know it's against the law for a Jew to enter in the house of a Gentile. Where's that in your Bible? Did you know it's not in your Bible? But did you know it was against the law? Civil law. Rabbinical law. We just see the word law. You know it's against the law for a Jew to go in the house of a Gentile? It was against the law. It wasn't against the Torah. It was against rabbinical law. You have to pay attention to what's being said. And when you run across something and go, that's kind of odd. That should be your first clue. You need to dig. Context, context, context. Folks, it is critically important. If you don't pay attention to this, this is where you run into what you think are contradictions. When they're not. When you're untrained, unstable, ignorant of the Torah, you start to twist, watch this, the letters that are explaining to their readers how to apply the Torah to their lives because they're usually dealing with problems. So they're trying, Peter, James, Paul, all of them are trying to, you guys are really messed up. The Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the church in Corinth, one messed up community, right? They were messed up, really. And they're like, we got to fix this. Um, you have to pay attention to what you're reading. And what we tend to do, we go straight to the letters. How about if we go straight to the book that's talking that's being talked about in the letters. Why don't we start at the beginning? That might help. Would you like to watch a movie from the end forward? <laughs> and that's what we're doing when we're reading our Bible and all we want to do is read the letters. And we haven't got a clue what the Torah is really talking about. And then we go, well, you know, it's against the law. and It's not against the law. If you don't know that it's not against the law, you read what Peter said. Well, I guess it was against the law. When it wasn't. It was against the rabbi's laws. And that list goes on and on and on. Context, 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 context. Who's talking? What are they talking about? For instance, Acts chapter 15. Is it okay if I just take off? Acts chapter 15. They call it, you know, the Jerusalem Council. You know what they were dealing with? Can Gentiles get saved without being circumcised? Meaning a full convert to Judaism. So Paul had these Judaizers following him throughout his ministry. Telling people that had already gotten saved, I'm sorry, dude, yours didn't really take. That's what they were telling them. You're really not saved because you're not Jewish. You need, to get to, you need to become Jewish because salvation comes first through the Jew. So you need to become Jewish or you can't get saved. Sorry. 
And it was freaking them out because they thought they were saved. How would you like for somebody to come to you and you thought you were really saved? You had this euphoric feeling. You know, Jesus comes in, you feel cleansed and all that. And then somebody says, sorry, you're still a little dirty. You're not getting in. That's a bummer, right? Yeah. I'm just like, you freaking kidding me? I just poured out my soul and cried out to God. And you told me Yeshua died, rose again, his blood cleansed me. And now these people are telling me I got to do, I got to do what? So they have this Jerusalem council to deal with that issue. So they go back and try to decide how do we tell these people, you know, what do we do? They come back with these rules, right? And then they'll say, well, see, that's all the Gentiles have to do. I'm like, did you keep reading? Did you just read the next sentence? Because James didn't stop there. He said... After all, is it okay if I do a Paul Henry paraphrase? After all, Moses is taught every week, go and learn. Duh, right? I mean, it's just pretty much that simple. And so people use that all the time. And I'm like, is it just me or has everybody gone absolutely bonkers? It's like, did you read it? I mean, can we read it? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm like, well, that's what it says right here. That's what it says right here. So context, context is king. Who's talking? What are they talking about? What are they dealing with? That's why you really didn't understand in Galatians who he's talking to and what they're talking about. And he's not telling them to turn back, you know, from following the Torah and keeping the biblical feast and the Sabbath. He's not telling them to stop doing that. That's a whole other thing, and I'm going to leave that to Pastor Mike because I need to stay focused on here. I have, I have no idea how long I've been going. I, this is what it's like. I have no idea. Okay, rule number, I mean, rule number three. First one is let's, uh, you need to take the first, your first interpretation is the simple surface meaning of the words. What, are, what, are they, what does it say? Simple. Number two, context, context, context. Who's talking? Who are they talking to? What are they talking about? Stop ripping this stuff out of context. What are they talking about? Number three, let Scripture interpret Scripture, not your opinion or their opinion. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Look for other places and ways where this word or phrase is used in your Bible. Let me tell you something. If you read something in your Bible and you go, man, I don't understand. I'm telling you, that's the Holy Spirit telling you, you need to dig. And you need to look. And you need to pay attention to the details. And pay attention to what I've already told you. It'll be a big clue to your answers. Folks, when you get back to um, the passage that we talked about at the very beginning about death, you can find the answer in two places, if you will, in Revelation. If you just start digging. And this is just one example. But in Revelation 2, verse 11, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach is saying to the Messiah's community. The one who overcomes will never taste or be harmed by the second death. We already talked about that, right? But there's another one that gives you a better explanation of what that is. In other words, you got to just keep looking. Revelation 21, verse 8. So Revelation 21, verse 8 says, But for the cowardly, this is the some that are standing there that will taste death at the coming, right? He says some will not taste it until this happens. And then there are others that will never taste it. So there's a comparison. Some are going to taste it, but they're going to taste it at the end of time. And some are never going to taste it. And here we're told that the ones that are never going to taste it, they're never going to suffer this second death. Well, what is this second death? Revelation 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot is in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is... The second death. Wow. You don't even need to know Greek or Hebrew to figure that one out. 
Isn't that cool? That's awesome. Folks, these are the three top rules. They're only, they're only the top ones. But if you'll practice these, they'll keep you in the right lane. They'll keep you from having a problem. Can I give you another example? In Luke, uh, Jesus and his disciples are walking through the field. His disciples are picking the grain off the heads, right? They're rubbing them together. They're eating them. And the rabbis come up and say, why are your disciples breaking the tradition of the elders and they're not washing their hands? Y'all familiar with that story? And the way they were talking about it is you had to have this special vase called a nagel vesser. And it was a vase that had two handles. And you're supposed to hold this handle and pour it over your hands and say this prayer. And you take this one, you pour it over your hand and say this prayer. And they say it's a prayer that God told us to pray that he didn't tell us to pray. Right? And that they were breaking the tradition. That's not what they're doing. So do you know the rest of the story? It's really pretty humorous. Jesus goes on a biological teaching spree. He tells them this is what happens when you eat food. It goes in your mouth. Ends up in your stomach. Ends up in the bowels. Ends up in the latrine. And then if you'll read closely... Luke gives you an editorial comment. It's in parentheses in your Bible. Thus, Jesus declared all foods clean. There you go, I can eat pork. They weren't talking about pork. They weren't talking about unclean foods. They were talking about breaking rabbinical rules. So here's what's fascinating. When you read that passage and you get to that thing about Jesus declared all foods clean... You know what's amazing? That Greek word can also be translated, watch this, purged. In other words, he said, when Jesus taught them this, he told them, your food doesn't make you clean or unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth that does it. The food that you eat that's declared food in your Bible, it ends up in the toilet. You guys don't know what in the world you're talking about. That's what he was saying. You guys are a bunch of knuckleheads. Food doesn't make you clean or unclean. What's in your heart will make you clean or unclean. And that's going to come out of your mouth because you can't stop it. What's in your heart is going to leak out. That's what's scary, amen. Am I the only one in here that ever has something leak out? You go, man, I wish I hadn't. Oh, oh. And on 635, it's real hard. Man, what a knucklehead. What is wrong with you? And we don't know what they're going through in their life. Amen? Now then, however, with all that being said, however, and this is a big however, you have to go back to what I said at the beginning. If your view that God and Yeshua will never lie to you or mislead you and that His Word is truth, life, and breath for us, then you will travel down the right path. You may go here and there, and God will use all of that to keep you on the right path to reveal to you what you need to know that day to get your life straightened out. Amen? Amen. But listen to this. As we get closer and closer to the end of time, do anybody here feel like we're at least in the birth pangs? I mean, you've got to be not only asleep, but you've got to have your head under the rock to not think we're in the beginning of birth pangs. As we get closer and closer... These rules are going to become exceedingly important for your survival. Here's why. You and I are already told in our Bible that there's a deception coming. It's coming. It is going to be so powerful that we in this room will be tempted to follow it. He said the elect themselves will almost fall for it if God himself did not intervene. You had better know your Bible. You had better know your God. You had better be searching after loving him and serving him. You'd better get into the spirit of the Torah or I'm telling you, trouble is coming. Now that's not trying to scare you. I'm just say, stating fact. It's hard. It's hard now, right? You feel it getting heated up? Sorry, but you haven't seen anything yet. It's coming. It will be big. It will rattle your faith. 
That's what we're told. It's going to rattle your faith. You will see things, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and they're going to do things, and you're going to go, what? That's not a YouTube fake. That, that really happened. And everybody's going to go, you see, your God's not God. And if you don't know your Bible and you're not in the foundation that my God is God, my God doesn't lie, my God is not wrong, my God is leading me, and no matter what is going on out there, no matter what the devil's doing, I will not let go of the fact that my God is God. Amen. That has to be your foundation. It must be your foundation. Or you are liable to fall for anything. Man, if anything would teach us something, it's church history. We can be knuckleheads. Absolute idiots. Twisting the Word of God to destruction unto damnation. Telling people that the Jews are the Christ killers and hating them. Anti-Semitism. That's straight out of the pit of hell. So let me give you a, a little example on how applying these truths are real important. Real important. Let's look at a passage of Scripture here. Jeremiah 7, verse 22 and 24. This one's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So let's just, let's just read it like we normally would, okay? Not like Sherlock Holmes. Let's just read it. Okay, listen to this. Jeremiah 7, 22 through 24. For on the day that I brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to them, nor did I command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But I explicitly commanded them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in all the ways that I command you, that it may go well with you. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed their own counsel. In the stubbornness of their evil heart, they have gone backward, not forward. Well, that's interesting. God just said right here, On the day I brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt, I didn't speak to them about... Offerings and sacrifices. I thought God commanded them about offerings and sacrifices. Didn't God command them about offerings and sacrifices? Am I, did He command them about offerings and sacrifices? I think He commanded them about offerings and sacrifices. And right here He says he didn't, he didn't do that. Oh, context. Oh, pay attention. Oh, so what does He say? Verse 22. On the day... I brought them out. Mm. When, in other words, what he's saying is, when I first brought them out, the first commandment wasn't about offerings and sacrifices. The Mount Sinai event was a marriage ceremony. Yep. He was marrying his people. The only commandment he gave them was, love me, serve me, obey what I say. I'll be your God, you'll be my precious people. Pretty much just that simple. They said, everything you said, we will do. And they moved into this marriage contract with God. And then broke it. The first commandment was just to love God. It was much later when God gave Moses all the rules and all the laws dealing with sacrifices and offerings and all of that stuff in the book of Leviticus. Right? Right? So it wasn't the first thing that he told them. So he did command them, just not on that day. So that's what he's trying to tell them. So people read this and they go, you see, God just lied. He did too command them. Not on that day, knucklehead. He did later. Oh my gosh. You see, those people that are doing that, I, man, I hate to say this because some of them, they think they're serving the king. No, they're not. They're serving themselves. They don't want to know what the Bible really says. They want to prove that their view of the Bible is correct. Right or wrong, they just want to prove that they're right. And they want to argue with you. Do yourself and everybody else a favor. Don't argue. They either want to know the truth or they don't. And one of the worst places you can do it is on social media. Let it go. Turn that dumb stuff off. It's not going to achieve anything. They don't want to search for truth. They just want to argue. 
I'm about to turn 66. I don't have time to argue. I just want to be around people that love God. Amen? Amen. I just want to have an intelligent conversation with people that actually want to know truth so that we can all find truth together and grow closer to God. Amen? Because that's where we're all headed. So this is explained even in more detail in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse... I'm sorry, in Jeremiah chapter 3. So you kind of get back to this idea... uh, Well, what God is after is a personal relationship with you and I. Amen? That's what He's after with everything. Your Bible and everything that's going on, He's trying to draw us into this close relationship with Him. Watch this. He's not after the letter of the law. Did you know that? He never was. He was never after us just doing the letter of the law. The problem is, we need that. And I'll get to that in just a second. He's always been after a personal relationship. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 10, watch this. He says, After all this, her unfaithful sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but only insincerely. This is a declaration of Yahovah Himself. He's putting his thumbprint on this statement. He's saying, I'm making a statement and this is my declaration. That's powerful, folks. So here's the background story. Israel's in now in two nations. You have the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is usually referred to as the house of Israel. The southern kingdom is usually referred to the house of Judah. The house of Israel was dispersed by Assyria, Uh, Judah was now coming under attack from Babylon. All that stuff was going on. That lasted a long time, by the way. And they decided, oh, we probably ought to get our act together. And so then they started worshiping God again. But if some of your Bibles, if you'll look at the Scriptures version or the ESV, it'll say uh, uh, in pretense only. Or falsely. They, they returned to me, but they did it falsely. Or they did it only in pretense. You ever had your kids apologize in pretense only? Some of you parents, y'all ain't old enough. To, some of y'all, y'all don't. We've, right? Can the parents see through that garbage? In a heartbeat. God can see through it. He says, they didn't do it with their whole heart. Now, I want you to see something that he explains to us in Isaiah chapter 1. It's verses 11 through 15. Verses 11 through 15, it says this, For what is it to me, the multitude of your sacrifices, says Yahovah, I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed animals. I have no delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or he-goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand, trampling my courts? Bring no more worthless offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of convocations. I cannot endure it. Iniquity with solemn assembly. Your new moons and your festivals my soul hates. They are a burden to me. I am weary to bear bear them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you multiply prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Folks, they were offering sacrifices and incense. Offerings coming into the temple. And God says, I can't take it. You're making me sick. I can't bear your stuff, your Sabbath keepings, your new moon celebrations. Big whoop de doo Your heart is far from me. You think I care about what you're doing? I care about what's in here. You're doing that so that you can get stuff. Treating God like a Ouija board. God don't play that game, folks. God's after our heart. So now let's get into the real spirit of the Torah. We see very clearly here that what God is really after right is our heart, right? Does Jesus lie to us? He's not going to mislead us or anything, right? 
the biggest example of the spirit of the Torah is laid out in the life of Jesus himself. It's found in Luke chapter 24. It's absolutely amazing. And following, you don't have to really turn there. It's, it's read the whole chapter. I don't think I gave y'all Luke 24, did I? <laughs> That came later. <laughs> uh, in Luke 24 is the famous uh, uh, road to Emmaus where Jesus meets the two disciples and they're going to Emmaus. And uh, so he talks to them along the way. They end up having dinner and he's explaining the scriptures to them, right? And what he does is he explains to them everything in the scriptures that was written about him. Here's the part that we tend to miss. These are his disciples. They didn't get it. And there's a reason. It's huge. There's a reason. Later in that same chapter is when, is when he's with the twelve. Right? They're all going, man, we saw him. Yeah, and he, he appeared to Peter and everything. Whoa! Jesus is alive. And all of a sudden, boom, there he is. Freaks them out. Right? He has a conversation with them. And then it says this. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. The Spirit of the Torah. In other words, what was it really all about? He said, everything written in the Scriptures are what? Written about Him. Everything. He's going to keep talking about this stuff and He's going to tell us something that's absolutely amazing if we'll just grasp it. The real heart. This is why I think I have such a passion for this. Have I really blown my time that bad? No, okay, good. I looked up and went, ooh, that's in red. <laughs> I don't usually preach with that up there. They don't want me to know what time it is. <laughs> oh, wow, that kind of took me back. Uh, so everything written in the Scriptures are written about Him, right? Here's what's fascinating. Have you ever heard that there are like over 300 prophecies about Yeshua that He fulfilled literally? Have you heard that? And the numerical uh, probability of that happening is like literally off the charts. I heard one guy describe it as like taking uh, the size of the state of Texas and filling it with silver dollars. 18 inches deep. You take one silver dollar, paint an X on it, Throw it out there, shake it up. You take one guy, blindfold him, and dump him out there in it. The size of Texas. Let him go, blindfolded, and he has to pull it out. Doesn't matter how long he walks. Let's say he can walk 100 years without eating, whatever. Right? He has to pull it out, first pull. That's the odds of that happening. And you go, how did they not see it? Simple. Almost all of those prophecies are not blatant prophecies. They were hidden. You know why? Because God was not going to tip His hand to the devil. <laughs> you see, God is dealing the cards. And He's even dealing the devil His hand. He says at the end of time, He's going to pull them in. I'm going to settle accounts. The apostles didn't get it. They didn't see it. They didn't understand it. That's when he started saying, you know, when I was hanging on the cross and I was quoting Psalm 22? I am Psalm 22. Isaiah 53? That is me. All of the law and the prophets. I fulfilled all of it. Backwards, forwards, inside and out to paint you a picture that I am the great I am. And I've come here to bring you home. The devil can't have you. I want to have a love relationship with you. I want to move back into this marriage covenant. And I'm going to die on the cross to nullify the divorce decree. That way I can legally remarry you. Some say it's the greatest love story never told. Absolutely amazing. 
You need to catch this. If we will actually study the Torah and follow the rules that are there, it'll keep us safe and keep us in our right lanes. And it's through that process that we'll actually learn the very reason that we were given the Torah from the very beginning. We were given the Torah to teach us to love our God. But many times we have to go through the actions over and over and over again to finally get it. So what's God doing? He's trying to recreate within you a character that actually loves Him. I'm old enough to have seen the movie The Karate Kid, the first one. (laughs) You young guys, never mind. Hold on a second. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Up, down, up, down, right? And he ends up getting mad, right? You just want me here because you're trying me to fix me to fix your house and fix your fence and paint your fence and wax your car, not realizing that his master was teaching him the skills that he needed. That's your Torah. Your Torah is teaching you to love your God. You think he really needs you to wear zit seats? You need to wear the zit seats. You think he needs you to keep the Sabbath? You need to keep the Sabbath. You think he needs any of that stuff? No. We do. When we do it, we learn to love him. Matthew 22. Oh my goodness. It's simple, folks. Your Bible's not complicated. It's simple. We make it complicated. We just won't slow down and read it. We won't use these simple rules. Who's he talking to? What are they talking about? What's the deal? What does the rest of the Bible say about it? The Bible can't have contradictions because my God wrote it. Duh. So if I don't understand it, I'm the one with the problem, not the book. So Yeshua was asked this question. You worship guys want to come on up. He was asked a simple question. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Cut to the chase for a second. I want you to notice he didn't say, well, you need to keep the Sabbath. You need to be Torah observant. You need to wear your seat seats. Don't eat no pig. He didn't say any of that, did he? He said, what's the greatest commandment? Well, he said to him, you're to love Yahovah, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and prophets hang on these two commandments. How much more simple can it be? Your Torah is hanging on loving God and loving His creation. Your neighbor. Your Bible in John says, if you say you love God and hate your neighbor, guess what? You're a liar. And the love of God does not dwell in you. The Word of God will tell you what sin is. We think sin is going against your heart. That's not true. You're told in your, in your Bible. Sin is going against what God said. Breaking the Torah. Anti-lawlessness. Going against what God said. If God said it, don't do it. If you do it, it's a sin. It's not going against your heart. Anybody here other than me lie to yourself? The scripture says your heart is exceedingly wicked. Who can know it? Sin isn't going against your heart. It's going against what God said. 
So watch this. God gave us His Torah because we need it. And when we live by it and practice it, we start habits. I think this is in your Bible. And those habits do what? Create a character. And out of that character, love and then patience and endurance and all of those things were told in our New Testament. That when you do these things continually, this is what happens. He's telling us when you follow the Torah, because you love God, He'll develop a character in you to love Him that you wouldn't have done on your own. And when we submit to its authority, watch this, you get off the throne. He stays on the throne. And then we live our lives in such a way as to glorify Him. And I'm going to give you this one more little thing. When you live according to the Torah, you're literally poking the devil in the eye. You're saying, my God is God. You are the biggest idiot of them all. And that is no joke. The head cherub in charge of worship, guarding the throne of God. And you blew it because you got jealous of us? What a dumb numbskull. You kidding me? Why do you think God took the high priest and dressed him in the jewels that was all over Lucifer before he fell? That's a fact, folks. Go and read your Bible. The fiery jewels that Lucifer was all around, they're on the breastplate of the high priest. God saying, the very thing you were jealous of, I'm going to put your jewels on him. You tried to destroy my creation. You tried to taint the DNA. You're trying to stop me from doing what I said I was going to do. Can't you figure this out? You can't stop me. You literally can't touch this. And you're going to end up in the fire. These three rules can quite possibly save your physical life. God loves you so much. He sent His Son to die for you. He wants to have a love relationship with you. He doesn't want a robotic one. He wants to have a relationship with you. Will you stand with me? It's been a real honor to be here today. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I have no idea how long I preached. But I felt I would do you and God a disservice if I didn't put some tools in your hand where you could go and do the work yourself. Because I'm not talking to people that are used to just being spoon-fed and you're fine with that. I'm talking to intelligent people that are desiring to serve your God. Do it. Read it. Submit to Him. If you'll just call out to him, he says, all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's not a New Testament quote, by the way. It's in your Old Testament. If you'll call out to him, he will respond. I'm going to pray for us, and then I think we're going to have some prayer people and turn this over to Pastor Mike or Pastor Dutton. Somebody come bail me out. (laughs) Bail them out. I'm going to pray, and then... uh, You do whatever it is that God needs you to do, okay? Call out to Him. I don't care what it is you're going through, what you've been through, what you think you're facing. God loves you. With all His heart, He's given you everything you need if you'll just take it, if you'll just grasp it. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we desperately need you. We need your grace and mercy. Lord, encourage us to dive into your word. Encourage us, Lord, to just fall in love with you. Lord, help us to get off the throne in our own lives and let you be on it. 
Help us, Lord, to be humble and submissive to you and your word. Forgive us, Lord, where we failed you. Lord, if there's anyone here or anyone that's watching that's struggling with their faith, God, I pray that you would reach through and touch all of us. Bring us into your kingdom. Bring us into your family. Heal us, O Lord, and we will be healed. Cleanse us, O Lord, and we will be cleansed. Create in me a clean heart, O God, because I cannot, but you can. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. I think God knew everything, right?